Hey everyone, welcome to Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff, um, the show where I get ready and talk about stuff. I know, that's weird. Um, so today is going to be a bit different. I wasn't sure that I was even going to record today because um, I have been busy, you know, working, making art to sell for the season, making jewelry, um, just, you know doing the things and I didn't have time or actually I did have time and it just slipped my mind to um, prepare my area my you know my little space here for recording but I thought you know what Stephanie nobody cares so I decided to just do this while I am getting ready for work because the topic I'm going to talk about today is something I've been reading up on for a, a while and I thought, well, you know what? There's no time like the present, so I'm going to do this today while I prepare for work. So the people that I'm gonna be talking about today, one of the reasons I chose this topic is because the holiday season is typically one in which, you know, people celebrate families. Um, and, and even if you don't necessarily celebrate your family, you at least tolerate your family because of the season. And I thought, you know, being that the people in this story I'm about to tell you are people I am related to, very distantly, but we are related, what would be better than honoring family, honoring, <laughs> that's a word I'm going to be using very loosely here, um, what better way to celebrate the, the spirit of family and the holidays that to talk about my very distant cousins, the Dalton brothers. Now, before we get into that, there was something I was going to say and it just flew right out of my mind. So I guess it wasn't that important. I literally, I was gonna say it and then it was gone, gone. So I'll just, if it comes back to me, I'll let you know later. So I'm gonna do my best to keep this story as concise as possible because as I was researching I found a wealth of information on these people and on you know the directions they took in their lives and quite honestly if I was going to make a, a video detailing every aspect of you know their lives from the time they were children to the time they each met their fate whatever that fate was um, we'd be here all dang day. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to summarize and hopefully get, still present you with an accurate picture. So the Dalton brothers were part of a family that had a whole bunch of kids. Their parents were Lewis and Adeline Dalton. Um, Lewis at the time of meeting Adeline and, and by the way, some of the accounts that I read of you know, the family history and stuff were not necessarily conflicting, but some were more complete than others. And then I had to just kind of piece it together. So if I get anything wrong, definitely tell me nicely. But I was certainly willing to own that sometimes the information I share on here may be incorrect, but I do my best. So anyway, Lewis and Adeline Dalton. Lewis was a saloon keeper in Kansas City, Missouri when he met um, Adeline. And Adeline, um, she was the aunt of Cole and Jim Younger, who were part of the James Younger gang. And as the story progresses, you'll see why that little bit of information is, if nothing else, it's interesting. So at any rate, so um, Jim, or Jim, Lewis and Adeline, moved the Dalton family, and they had like 12 children. So, and this is important. In the family, there were basically like, almost like two sets of kids. There were the older kids, and you know, by the time this next event happens, a lot of the older kids, including the, you know, those that were part of the gang in the future, um, they had moved on with their lives. They were living independently, making their own decisions and so forth, still staying close to family as far as proximity, but they were on their own. And this is relevant because 
1886, the Dalton family, Lewis and Adeline and all of their children, there were like 12 of them or so, they moved to Kansas and they moved near Coffeyville, Kansas. And what happened in, when they moved, so they moved into, um, you know, I guess we have these romantic notions and call it things like the Wild West or whatever the case might be, but they moved to this area that was very much um, new territory. You know, people were playing fast and loose with the laws and, and you know, standards for behavior and so forth. And that was what the children witnessed um, when they moved there. Now, of all of the children, so there were the older set of kids that were already out on their own. And then in the younger set, there were, um, there was Bob and Emmett and they, because they were so much younger than their other brothers, they ended up being very close. And that is going to come into play later in the story as well. So I'm giving you all these little tidbits that are going to become relevant as the story unfolds. So Lewis Dalton was many things among them being a pretty hardcore gambling man. And what he would do is he would uh, bet on horses and he would he would travel out he would travel and one of the places he went was out to California and he would bet on horse races and so forth and sometimes he would take his sons out there with him like as the boys you know the older kids and then as the little kids became big kids and then young men he would take them with him and they got to see a um, more seedy side of life than what they were experiencing in Kansas. And again, this planted seeds in their lives that would come to fruition later because what they witnessed told them that, you know, a little bit of dishonesty is okay. You know, if that's what you have to do to get by, then that's just what you have to do. And, and that's fine. Now, Lewis Dalton was such a gambling man that at one point he actually lost the house that his family was living in. It was, you know, that was all he had left to gamble with and he gambled and he lost. And I believe it was shortly before this next event that this happened because in 1889, when the Oklahoma territory opened up um, and people could go stake a claim, the sorry, Lewis and Adeline packed up their kids and headed out to stake a claim. On the way, however, unfortunately, Lewis would die and Adeline was then stuck with raising all of these children, all the younger children. Like I said, the older ones were already out on their own, but all of the younger Dalton kids all by herself. And she still carried on. She went to um, Oklahoma Territory. She staked a claim near Kingfisher and she and the, the children she had with her ended up living in a dugout for a, a period of years while they were um, building a home. So what were the older Dalton boys up to when all this was going on when Adeline was in Oklahoma Territory living in a, in a dugout? Well, they actually at one point were on the side of the law. They were actually law enforcement officers. Um, Frank Dalton was a deputy marshal in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Bob Dalton served on posses that were led by Frank Dalton. And this was Bob's first uh, introduction, I guess, to that lifestyle that, you know, living, um, you know, practicing law enforcement, um, you know, knowing what it's like, knowing the power, I should say, that comes with carrying a badge. And he apparently really enjoyed it. And you'll understand in a few minutes. But so Frank Dalton was the U.S. Marshal in a, U a U.S. Deputy Marshal, I should say, in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And took brother Bob on, on um, 
various missions with him, if you will. On November 27th, 1887, Frank Dalton was killed in the line of duty um, during a shootout with the Smith-Dixon gang. So it's my understanding that the Smith-Dixon gang, they were bootleggers. And sometimes we've, you know, when you think of bootleggers and so forth, you might think of um, the Prohibition era in the 1920s, but this was way before then, obviously. And the the thing was, Indian Territory, which would later become Oklahoma, um, that was, it was dry. You were not allowed to have alcohol there. So bringing alcohol into the territory and selling it or, um, you know, obviously consuming it, that was against the law. So it was Frank's duty, if he knew of these bootleggers, to handle them. And that was what he was attempting to do. Unfortunately, Frank lost his life in the process. But never fear, another Dalton brother is here. Dalton brother Gratt was commissioned to take his brother Frank's place in Fort Smith as a deputy marshal. And <clears throat> Bob Dalton was commissioned to serve as a deputy marshal for a federal court in Wichita, Kansas. So the, the Dalton brothers are carving out a name for themselves in an honest way. Now, there is obviously, you know, it, it, it was the quote, Wild West, and the line between, you know, law and outlaw was pretty thin sometimes, but at the time anyway, Bob Dalton and Brother Gratt, they just seemed like, you know, guys who were going to get the job done. And, you know, they were, they were given positions with, with authority, which, you know, considering later events is a bit shocking, but we'll get into that. So while Bob was a, um, <sighs> Okay, so let, we're going to go back to 1888. So prior to Bob becoming a uh, U.S. Deputy Marshal in Wichita, he would sometimes help his brother Gratt execute, no, not execute, he would join posses that were led by his brother Gratt to pursue these criminal elements that were, you know, smuggling alcohol into the territory and other such things. Now, at one point, though, Bob Dalton... Uh, became aware, Bob and Grant together did, but Bob Dalton particularly took this one to heart. He became aware of a man who was apparently posing as a, as a deputy. And in doing so, he was giving out false information about crimes that were being committed. He was, um, he was using his authority as a deputy to swindle people, just really being a jerk <laughs> and doing that under the guise of being a, a deputy because he apparently had, um, you know, a convincing enough presentation of himself that people would believe him. Well, Bob knew this was going on. Brother Gratt, he assumed, was getting a warrant for this man's arrest. And Bob thought, you know what, I'm going to help out my brother and I'm going to go on ahead with a posse and track this guy down and just make this easier. So he forms a posse. Keeping in mind, Bob Dalton himself is not yet a law enforcement officer. Okay, He still is just a guy who occasionally helps out on posses when needed. But he obviously really, really likes doing that, given this given what's about to happen. So they pursued this guy. They tracked him to his cabin. And as they approached the cabin, there, you know, they were started experiencing gunfire. You know, they were being fired upon as they approached. And uh, Bob went around um, to the south end of the cabin and as he rounded the corner, there stood the man they were pursuing. And without any hesitation whatsoever, Bob shot and killed the man. 
being that Bob was not a law enforcement officer and being that his brother was not there, there was no warrant, it was just Bob basically taking matters into his own hands, he was charged with murder. He and the whole posse were charged. And that happened in, I believe it was in March. Anyway, the they ended up going to trial. I believe it was in November. And ultimately, the posse, Bob and the whole posse, they would be cleared. But the strain of the trial and his destroyed reputation and just everything that came with what happened after this incident at the man's cabin, it weighed on Bob very heavily. And he started drinking. Now remember, that is illegal in Indian Territory. You are not supposed to have alcohol. You are not supposed to be consuming alcohol in Indian Territory. So in doing that, Bob pretty much wiped out any chances that he was going to be hired as a U.S. Deputy Marshal to work alongside his brother Grat at Fort Smith. Now, eventually, both of the men would um, be working in Wichita, and Bob also, to make more money, he worked in he worked for, with the Osage Nation, and I believe it was in a law enforcement capacity. Because the thing with working for the U.S. Marshals was that you had you would get paid, but it would be, from what I understand, again, I could be wrong, it would be piecemeal. Like, instead of saying this is your salary that you can count on every month, it would be, you know, if you execute a... A, an arrest warrant, you get this amount of money. If you, um, you know, catch a, a bootlegger trying to smuggle alcohol into the territory, you get this amount of money. So it was very, not only was it piecemeal, but also it was very sporadic because the U.S. Marshal's Office could not pay any of the deputies until they received the funds from the United States government. And those funds were traveling by train to Indian Territory, and it was only when that train arrived with the money and it was all accounted for that the marshal could then turn around and pay the deputies he'd hired. So to make the time between paychecks from the U.S. Marshal a little bit more bearable, um, Bob took up a job with the Osage Nation practicing law enforcement. And what that meant is he would get a monthly salary instead of like every four months or six months or whatever the case. And that was something that they could count on because even though they were, you know, all the, so you had Brother Grat as a U.S. Deputy Marshal, you had Brother Bob as a U.S. Deputy Marshal, and then you also had Brother Emmett because remember, wherever Bob goes, Emmett is sure to follow. Um... Emmett would occasionally work on posses organized by his older brothers, but he also worked as a cowboy. So, but despite all of that, all three of them having a paycheck, money was tight. And, you know, they did end up having to purchase a lot of things on credit as they waited for their checks from the U.S. Marshal to, or their checks, their cash from the U.S. Marshal to come in. So it was, it was difficult, and that would, I think, feed into what was coming for the future. So at one point, Bob just could not help himself anymore. He went into the U.S. Marshal's office in, I believe this was in Wichita, and he complained that the pay was too low, and he didn't like having to wait months and months at a time to get paid for work that, you know, he was doing every day. Well, the U.S. Marshal did not appreciate that bit of insight whatsoever, and he ended up firing Bob right on the spot. So then Bob went from having only sporadic paychecks to having none, at least from the U.S. Marshal. However, 
One thing that the U.S. Marshal who fired him did not do was take his badge. He didn't take his badge. He didn't take, they called it a commission. I don't know if it's like a, a, a paper. I don't know. I don't know what that is. But he didn't take his badge or his commission. And that left Bob in the, in the position of being able to carry out what could possibly be called, you know, like his, not really a heist, but definitely, um, definitely some seriously dishonest behavior because what Bob ended up doing, first of all, he didn't tell his brothers that he had been fired and they had no way of knowing that he had been fired because he still had his badge and he still had that commission, whatever that is. So Bob <laughs> keeping his badge, keeping his commission, keeping in mind he also worked for the Osage Nation. He would make sure to patrol the like furthest parameters of the Osage Nation because what he did not want is to have a run-in with the deputy who forgot to take his badge and then have a very public firing. He wanted to avoid that at all costs. And what he would end up doing was, as he's patrolling these outer reaches of the Osage Nation, he would come upon um, people traveling, you know, coming into the territory with suspicious looking vehicles. I don't know if they appeared heavy. I don't know. But what he would do is he would stop these um, wagons. He would find a stash of liquor or something. And instead of arresting them and taking them into the U.S. Marshal's office, he would just, he would find them and send them on their way. And I would imagine he also confiscated some, if not all, of their liquor, although I was thinking about that, and I don't know how he could have taken all of it without raising suspicions, because, you know, he was trying to lay low. So I would imagine that confiscating large stashes of liquor would have definitely interfered with that. Um, so that was how he got some extra money. He used his badge to basically scare people into handing over various sums of money because they were caught with liquor and Bob made, you know, I would imagine at least a decent wage for himself doing that. My eyes are going to look absolutely weird today, you guys, because I didn't start with any kind of plan. I'm just like throwing stuff on there. <laughs> And hoping it looks okay, and I'm, I'm not so sure it does. But anyway, so he never used, he never told his family he was fired and would take their money, be on their way. Um, let's see, where are we going with this? Okay, so let's talk about Emmett for a minute because his story, as all of this unfolds, is interesting. Now, as I said, Emmett and Bob, they were for lack of a better or perhaps more humorous term, they were thick as thieves indeed because they were so close in age. Their other brothers were much older and Bob and Emmett, they just always had each other and that didn't change as they grew into adults. So, um, you know, Bob was more than, or I'm sorry, Emmett was more than happy to tag along with Bob wherever he went. And now the difference in this case is that Rather than following his brother's footsteps into law enforcement, he primarily worked as a cowboy and would only occasionally join in on posses. And through his work as a cowboy, he would meet other men who would eventually become part of the Dalton gang in the future. And some of these guys were already fleeing from legal matters in other, uh, in other states or yeah. And came to Indian territory because it was easy to just kind of disappear into it. I mean, it was, it was massive. It was not well established yet by the Americans. There were already indigenous people living there and they had very well established cultures and, you know, Americans being Americans went in there and said, no, this is mine now. 
And that is unfortunate, but that is not what I'm going to talk about today. Although that, that did create a culture of um, almost anarchy in the Wild West, as we so romantically like to call it. Anyway, the men that he met through his job as a cowboy, he met Bill Doolin. He met Bill Power, who also occasionally went by the name Tom Evans. He met Charlie Pierce, who had fled Missouri to Indian Territory to avoid going to jail for peddling whiskey. He met Dick Broadwell, who was from Kansas, but he had claimed to stay, he had staked a claim in Oklahoma Territory and was there just long enough to meet a woman, get married, be swindled by this woman, and then find his way back to Indian Territory. He met, or met his way back to Kansas, I'm sorry. He met Bitter Creek Newcomb, who was from Kansas, and he, had, he began his career as a cowboy at age 12. And he met Charlie Bryant, also from Texas, and he, he had a gunpowder burn across his cheek that earned him the nickname Blackface Charlie. So they were, um, these were the very humble beginnings of what would eventually become the Dalton Gang. I'm going to pause now because we're going to get into some nitty gritty next, but I want to get the, my eyes done so I can really focus. So hang with me. I'll be right back. All right, and I am back. This lipstick is a much brighter pink than I anticipated, and that is okay. We're just going to go with it. So, as I mentioned, Bob and Emmett Dalton often worked together, um, insofar as Emmett ever did work in law enforcement. Um, and they walked a very fine line between law and outlaw. And this would eventually kind of catch up with them. So on March 21st, 1890, they were charged with selling whiskey in the Osage Nation. It is my understanding that it was the chief himself who ended up turning them in. And, you know, they were charged. They jumped bail. They fled to New Mexico with their first gang, if you will. And that included Bitter Creek Newcomb, Bill... M McElhinney? I don't know how to pronounce that one. I'm sorry. Uh, black and Blackface Charlie. So it, this could be where they committed their first robbery. So what happened was, so they fled to New Mexico and they went into a, a gambling house that was there and they thought, we're very good gamblers, so let's go gamble and let's win lots of money. Well, that's not what ended up happening. They gambled and lost very heavily. And when they lost, they insisted that the game was crooked, it had been rigged against them, and at gunpoint, you know, holding everyone at gunpoint, they ended up taking back all their losses and then some. And that was like, I guess you could say that is the beginning officially of their career as criminals. So they ended up going to California. What they knew is they could not go back to where they had been. They had they went on to California to their brother Bill. And Bill was, um, he, he had a ranch out there. And he was a good law-abiding citizen at the time. And they thought, we're just going to go to Bill's. We're going to lay low. We'll work on his ranch. And we're going to be fine. It'll be fine. We'll just go hang out with our brother. Meanwhile, Grat had been charged with stealing horses. And he ended up being released for lack of evidence. But he was fired from his position with the U.S. Marshal's Office for conduct unbecoming of an officer. One of the accounts that I read said that at this point, uh, Grat went back to his went to his mother's house, stayed there for a bit, and she actually asked him if he would look out for his younger brothers because she was worried about the um, the trajectory of their lives at that point, worried they were going to become like their cousins, who, if you remember, were from the a, a gang, the Smith Younger Gang, I believe it was. She didn't want that for her sons, so allegedly. She asked Grat if he would look out for his younger brothers, and he said, of course I will, Mom. And he went out to California, also taking up residence at Bill's ranch. Now, Bill Dalton um, is an interesting character. 
He was married and he was living a respectable life before his brothers came along. Um, you know, he was respected in his community. He was involved in politics in his community. He was a member of the populist party. And the main um, emphasis of the populist party was these land disputes that they had with uh, Southern Pacific Railroad. And being in a land dispute with the railroad and, and, and engaging in politics that attempted to hold the railroad accountable for anything that it had done was somewhat of a losing battle because um, the Southern Pacific Railroad obviously had a lot of money to fund a political machine and it really didn't matter what you said or did to them, you were not going to win because I guarantee you didn't have the funding needed to fight that battle. So it was a very bitter battle and, you know, Bill was right in the thick of it. He referred to the Southern Pacific or the South Pacific Railroad as the South Pacific robber barons. I mean, there were no, no pleasant sentiments held for the railroad by people who were being victimized by it. Um, it was said too that he believed, Bill believed he could keep his younger brothers out of trouble if he just kept them busy on the ranch, kept them working, and, you know, when, he would just keep them out of trouble. And when there was a point where, when it became apparent that um, they weren't really working out very well at his ranch, he uh, contacted, he, he made contact with another rancher who needed assistance, and, you know, he told his brothers, I've, I've arranged for you to go live at that ranch where you can work and, um, you know, build a, a life for yourself. And so the brothers, according to one account, um, were like, sure, Bill, that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> and so they packed up, they left Bill's ranch as if they were going on to, um, you know, build an honest life for themselves, but just at, you know, at a different location and that was not what happened at all. They never made it to the other ranch because along the way they concocted a plan. And this at this point was Bill Emmett, or I'm sorry, Bob Emmett and Grant. They had come up with a plan to begin their life of criminality. Um, and because they concluded, you know, Bill thought, you know, work hard, build an honest life for yourself, you'll be fine. And they were like, Mm, I kind of think we would do better as outlaws, but thanks, Brother Bill. So on February 6th, 1891, Bill, Bob, uh, Bill, yes, Bill, and I'm going to get to that in a second. So, and this is where the different, different uh, stories about the Daltons can kind of muddy the waters because did the, did Bob, Emmett, and Grant leave Bill's ranch with the intention of becoming you know, career criminals, or did they get Bill roped into their schemes first? And that, I don't know. I don't know. I asked my mom if there was any family lore shared about the Daltons, and there never was. I would imagine that, um, you know, sitting around talking about how our ancestors were robbers and murderers was probably not the thing <laughs> that people wanted to do. So, I know I just said that they left Bill's ranch and, you know, Bill sent them on their way to go build honest lives for, lives for themselves. I don't know if that actually happened, but what we do know for sure is that Bill would ultimately participate with his brothers in illegal acts. So on the, the their first train robbery for Bill, Bob, Grant, and Emmett happened on February 6th, 1891 in Alila, California. I believe that is how it's pronounced. So Bill uh, himself did not actually at that time participate in any of the actual theft. But what he did was he kept passengers from interfering with the, you know, with what was going on with his brothers by firing shots over their heads, basically letting them know I'm here, I'm armed, I will take you out if I have to. Meanwhile, Bob Gratt and Emmett went and found the engineer, George Radcliffe, to take them to the uh, the express car, which was where all the cash was held and everything. And, you know, they, they held him at gunpoint, told him, show us where the car is, etc. 
Now, the armed guard in the cash car saw the men approaching, and he immediately doused all the lights in the car, locked the door, laid low. The Dalton brothers, being the geniuses that they were, decided it would be a good idea, seeing that the door was locked and the lights were out, didn't know if anybody was in there or not. They fired into the car through the windows, and the armed guard fired back. Um, and it was a very, very clumsily handled shootout. One thing the Daltons did, which is, I guess, smart, n they didn't both engage in a gunfight at once. That way, when one of them was empty, the other one could take over, so there was never a time where they didn't have ammunition at the ready. Nevertheless, they didn't, they didn't achieve their goal. They did do something else, though. So while this gunfight was going on, the engineer that they'd had at Gud Point, he attempted to flee. Uh, Emmett shot at him, and the engineer fell dead. And they, you know, the guys realized they're not going to be able to get into this car, this armed guard. If he's even still alive in there, he is not going to open the door for us. They ended up leaving with nothing, empty-handed. And they went and terrorized people and killed someone for no reason. There has been, I did read, an, an, again, another account that said that the engineer was not actually killed by one of the Dalton brothers, that he was killed by a bullet that had ricocheted. Um, and it was actually the bullet, the bullet came from the armed guard's gun. I don't have any verification of that whatsoever. I think it's, you know, looking at, you know, all things being equal, I think it's more likely that... It was Emmett's gun that killed him. But what do I know? So anyway, the, the, the a robbery attempt failed. They rode away, didn't, you know, unsuccessful, and were like, well, dang, that didn't work out. So they were still going to have to, um, there were still going to be consequences, though. So Bob and Emmett left California, went back to Kansas, whereas Grat and Bill were arrested. So back in Kansas, in May of 1891, Bob and Emmett reconnected with all their buddies from back there, all of these good, wholesome people they knew, and they decided they were going to try to pull off yet another bank robbery because it had worked out so well the first time. So they pulled off a heist and... Um, that one was worth one thousand seven hundred forty-five dollars. In the you know back then, that which would be worth I don't even know like a gajillion dollars today. I'm not sure, but in California, remember Bill and Grat were both arrested. Grat was found guilty of a train robbery, and he was sentenced to twenty years in prison for what he had done. Bill Dalton was acquitted. And I was wondering why, because they were both charged with the same thing, why Grat was found guilty, Bill was not. Um, I have to, th I suspect that, you know, even back then, word gets around about people. And Grat had, by that time, built a reputation for himself as being, you know, not the best person, definitely not a man of good character, and he, you know, I'm sure by that time people were starting to whisper about the fact that he'd lost his job due to um, poor conduct and so forth. Maybe that came into play, I don't know. So the next heist, heist, the next heist that would be carried out by the Dalton gang would be carried out by Bob, Emmett, Bitter Creek Newcomb, Bill Power, Dick Broadwell, Charlie Pierce, and Bill Doolin. On September 21st, 1891, they boarded a, a, a train and stole $2,500 in cash. And I, would, I think they also hustled the passengers for jewelry and whatever they could hand over. While this was, while this was going on, Grat escaped when he was you know, being transferred. Uh, he escaped. And legend has it, he jumped off a moving train and was like, I'm out, and he ran back to Kansas. And he reconnected with Bob and Emmett and the rest of the gang. So the Dalton gang, in the, in the winter of 1891, they laid low, 
you know, things were quiet and probably much to the relief of um, train passengers and engineers everywhere. Winter of 1891 was pretty uneventful. But then June 1892 came around and they were like, okay, it's time to get back at it. We've got big things to do. So their first robbery of 1892 was abysmal. So they did their usual thing. They boarded the train. They, uh, you know, hassled the passengers to hand over money, jewelry, whatever they had. And they got into the express car and they took the safe that was in there and like threw it out the window, jumped off the train and uh, dashed off into the horizon. Um, they only got, a, they only, <laughs> their take on that one was only $50. There was only $50 in the safe. They didn't get much from the passengers. But what also happened was that they showed that their instincts as criminals was being sharpened because prior to robbing that train, there had been another train that approached. And this train, so this happened after nightfall apparently. So this train as it was approaching, it had its lights, lights off. It was, um, it was just very eerie. And they, the, the gang was like, nope, we're not messing with that one. They fell back into the shadows because they had been preparing to, you know, approach the train. They fell back into the shadow, shadows. And as it would turn out, that train that they let pass was full of armed guards that was guarding somewhere around $70,000 in assets. So that would have been, that would have ended horribly for them had they robbed that train. Um, in July of 1892, the gang pulled off yet another train robbery. And what they did was they arrived at the train station in Pryor Creek. This was on July 14th. And as they were waiting at the train station, they took everything, you know, anything of value that they could get their hands on. And then they just waited. They just sat there and waited for the train to arrive. They had their their shotguns laying across their lap. They were just cool as could be. And when the train arrived, it also had many armed deputies aboard, but for some reason, all of these deputies were gathered at the rear of the train. And what that meant for the Dalton gang was a very easy robbery. They backed a wagon up to the express car. They very easily overpowered the one armed guard that was there. And they just started emptying the car. They took everything. Now, once it was discovered that this robbery was taking place, of course, there was a shootout and the shootout ended up killing two guards and an innocent bystander who was just there like, what the heck's everybody so upset about? And then got killed. I, I mean, I'm sure that was exactly what was said. The Dalton gang, however, they escaped virtually unharmed and they had $17,000 in cash. That at the time, you know, that I, to me, that's a lot of money now, but at the time that would have been like an astronomical amount of money. But at that point also, that was when the wanted posters started going out and there was a $5,000 reward put on each of their heads. So no longer were they you know, the, this anonymous band of outlaws. They were the Dalton gang. They were being pursued by law enforcement. Uh, pub the public was now made aware that these were very dangerous people. And because they were so dangerous, there was a substantial reward being offered for their capture and for, you know, turning them in. And that was when the Dalton gang decided they needed to lay low for a little bit. And they ended up going their separate ways for a short time, a very short time, because they just could not shake that itch to go commit more robberies. So they all ended up getting back together after, after a while, after they felt like, you know, maybe people aren't really looking for us as much as they were. Uh, we can safely get back together and plan our next robbery. So what they planned on doing, it was going to be the biggest heist they had done so far. They planned to go into Coffeeville, Kansas, and, uh, yeah, we're just going to, I'm just going to, I don't want to tell you their plan. You'll just, you'll figure it out, you know, because it's so mysterious. I don't want to give anything away. 
It's actually not that mysterious. The, the, the mystery in this is how they thought they were going to get away with it. <laughs> so on October 4th, 1892, the men, after, you know, planning this, this brilliant job they were going to pull off, they set out for Coffeyville, Kansas, and that night they made camp at a farm that was about four miles west of Coffeyville, and they prepared for the next day. Now, early on the morning of October 5th, the men entered into Coffeyville, which was already up and bustling with activity at, at nine in the morning, and they took their, they rode into an alley, and that was where they dismounted their horses, and they adjusted their fake beards, that was their disguise they had put on fake beards and they started walking toward the town square and they did it with um, three of the men in the front and then two men standing behind them and that was how they entered into the square now despite these brilliant brilliant disguises that they had uh, put on their faces as soon as they stepped into the light somebody recognized them like immediately Alec McKenna recognized one of the Dalton brothers and he was watching them, and he watched them walk into the bank, and as soon as he could see that there was a gun aimed at the cashier, he shouted, the bank is being robbed. So the townspeople are aware something horrible is happening. They start arming themselves with whatever they could find, and they actually armed themselves with items from the hardware store. So while that's all happening outside, so Grant... Dick Broadwell and Bill Power, they entered the C.M. Condon and Company Bank, and they immediately took uh, one of the owners, a bookkeeper, and a cashier hostage and demanded that they open the safe and give them the money. Now, this cashier, whose name I neglected to write down, my, my deepest apologies, um, he, he was thinking very quickly, and he said, you know what, the lock for that safe is a time lock. And it's going to be impossible to get it open until the time lock, until it's time to, which is in about 10 minutes. Now, Bob, or I'm sorry, Bill, Grat, Dick, and, um, yeah, Grat, Dick, and Bill, they all, they bought it. They were like, oh, well, okay, we can wait 10 more minutes, I guess. And that gave the townspeople more time to uh, arm themselves, to take up defensive positions and so forth. Meanwhile, Bob and Emmett had gone across the plaza to the First National Bank, and they also um, held a cashier, a bookkeeper, and another man at gunpoint demanding the cash on hand. Now, while that was happening, um, let me think. No, this happens first. So Bob and Emmett, they get the money. Then they attempt to exit the bank through the front door using the hostages as human shields, thinking nobody's going to fire at us because they, they don't want to hit one of these guys. Well, they were very wrong about that. And as soon as they got outside, um, they probably didn't even get through the door. Uh, people started firing at them and they're like, oh crap, okay, let's think of another plan. And they ended up uh, exiting the bank through the rear. Meanwhile, Across the street at the first bank that they that at the bank with Grat and Bill and Dick, while they were waiting for the time lock to uh, release, bullets started coming in through the windows of the bank, and they were like, "Oh man, how did that happen?" And they also exited the building, and all three of the men were shot. They were hit by these bullets when they came out of the building. So at this point, you've got. Um, Grat, Bill, and Dick running out of the Condon Company Bank. You've got Bob and Emmett running out of the First National Bank. They're all heading toward the alley where their horses are. And as they get into the alley, they're being followed, of course. And Bob and Emmett stop just long enough to turn around and shoot to death two, two civilians, two armed civilians who had followed them into the alley to um, try to retrieve what was stolen and, of course, hold them accountable for this thing they just did. So they were like, no, nah, we're not doing that. We're just going to kill these guys. So they killed them, and Grat ended up taking cover behind an oil tank and fired at the men who had followed him, and he ended up killing U.S. Marshal Conley. Now, Bob Dalton... In this gunfire that broke out, he was shot 
and he ended up falling down into a sitting position and he clumsily is firing back. Boom, 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 boom. It was just like that. Boom, 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 boom. And then he slumped over dead. Grant Dalton, already injured, uh, was very clumsy in his, in his firing, also doing this, you know. And somebody, um, again, I forgot to write down the name. Sorry. They, uh, very, they, they stood over him and just shot him in the neck and just ended it right there. Grant was done for. Bill Power, he was killed about 10 feet from Grant Dalton. Dick Broadwell did manage to get to his horse, and he mounted his horse, and he rode about half a mile before falling out of his saddle and dying in the middle of the road. So, where is Emmett? Well, Emmett, he was carrying the money bag from First National, and while he was mounting his horse, he was shot and injured in his right arm, his left hip, and his groin. Still, he managed to get on the horse. He rode back to the alley, um, or he rode toward Bob to try to retrieve Bob. And as he was reaching down to pull his brother up, a man named Casey Seaman unloaded both barrels of his shotgun into Emmett Dalton's back. Emmett fell from his horse, and with the one, un you know, probably the only uninjured part of his body he had, he held up his hand in surrender. At that point, he was taken to the office of a Dr. Wells, who did not predict that Emmett was going to even last till nightfall. Emmett was, he had 20 bullets in his body, and the doctor said he's going to be dead by nightfall, but Emmett survived. So the whole gunfight lasted less than 15 minutes, it left eight men dead and three wounded. The four men who died, in addition to the outlaws, um, they were Marshal Charles Connolly, Lucius Baldwin, George Cubine, and Charles Brown. So Emmett would end up standing trial, and he was sentenced to life in prison for what he had done. However... I think there was a perception that Emmett was only there because of his brother Bob. Because after his sentencing, there were people he had worked with, you know, who spoke up on his behalf and just said, you know, he, he's not beyond redemption. You know, he got involved in a lot of this stuff because of his brother Bob, but Emmett, um, he is not a lost cause. So, in 1907, Emmett was fully pardoned, and he went on to live a full life. In 1908, he married his wife, Julia, and two years later, they moved to California, where Emmett worked as a building contractor. And then he also co-authored the book, When the Daltons Rode, with newspaper man Jack Youngmeyer, and that book was published in 1931. After the publishing of the book, Emmett and Julia, they went back to Coffeyville, Kansas, and they received a celebrity's welcome. Um, you know, whatever took place in those streets so many years ago, apparently most of the people in Coffeyville did not hold Emmett criminally responsible for them and had the impression that the people who were really there, or the people who were there who were the real culprits, died that day. So Emmett was given a tremendous amount of grace <laughs> um, for his role in the robbery in Coffeyville. So Emmett died in his Long Beach, California home on July 13th, 1937, and he was 66 years old. In 1940, when The Dalton's Road was made into a movie, and Julia Dalton served as a, like a technical advisor, and she also attended the premiere of the movie, which took place in Coffeyville. So what happened to the rest of the gang? Because not everyone who was part of the gang was present for the robberies that day. Du Bill Doolin, Bitter, Bitter Creek Newcomb, and Charlie Pierce were not there. So what happened? Well, the, re the members who survived 
continued down the path of a life of crime is what happened. So Bill Doolin was actually rumored to have been at the Coffeyville robberies uh, holding the horses in the alley. And it is rumored that he is the only person who was there that day who um, actually ended up surviving. And he uh, fled the scene and went on to live his life of crime. Crime and corruption. Now, Bill Dalton, now once upon a time, he was a law-abiding citizen. He was, he was one of the good guys, not so much anymore. He rejoined the remaining members of the Dalton gang, and they formed a new gang that terrorized the region for years, and it was called the Doolin Dalton Gang. And what happened to them? Well, Bitter Creek Newcomb and Charlie Pierce were turned in for the $5,000 reward on each of their heads, and they were shot by U.S. Deputy Marshals. Blackface Charlie Bryant was arrested in 1891 during a transfer. Or he was arrested in 1891, so obviously this even predates the, the Coffeyville robberies. During a transfer, because where he was arrested there was no prison, so he was going to have to be transferred to a larger uh, city where they did have a prison. And the arresting officer, Deputy Short, rode with him um, for this transfer. Somehow, he got Bryant got hold of a gun. He fired at Deputy Short, who returned fire. And, you know, when all the smoke cleared and people could piece together what happened, it turned out that Deputy Short and uh, Charles Charlie Bryant were killed by each other's bullets. Bill Dalton was killed on June 8th, 1894 by a posse in Andarco, I think that's the name, Oklahoma. He was killed by a posse anyway. And finally, Bill Doolin was killed on August 25th, 1896 in a standoff with a posse led by a man named Heck Thomas, who pursued him after Doolin had escaped jail in January of 1896. So he was on the run for... Um, a good seven months before he was captured, which is kind of outstanding, really. Um, but I guess you'd also have to have a lot of people in your life who are willing to lie for you <laughs> to make that possible. And I guess when you surround yourself with a criminal element, of course, you're going to find a lot of people willing to lie for you, unless it's more beneficial to tell the truth so they can save themselves. Um, years ago, I was a teenager and I had always wanted to see one of Laura Ingalls Wilder's homesteads. So we went, my, my mom and dad and my sister and I, we went to Missouri, or Missouri, if you will, and we saw her homestead there. And my mom reconnected with some of her relatives. And, you know, in the course of conversation, she told them that she was um, starting to put together the family tree. And... Her relative said to her, leave the family tree alone. It's rotten at the roots. Having done the reading that I've done so far, I'd like to actually read some books, not just articles, but having done the reading I've done so far on the Daltons and the life they led and how that came to be, um, yeah, I would have to, you know, at least to an extent, agree with my relative there. Um, also, um, what was I going to say? So I was thinking about, you know, how do they fall into this life of crime? And I was thinking, you know, given the, the circumstances they were in, you know, it was a hard scrabble life to live in, out in the, you know, to live in the wild west. I mean, you really had to know how to take care of yourself if you were going to do it. Um, and I, I, at first that seemed like, yeah, that kind of somewhat makes it understandable that they did this. But then I was like, no, because you know what? There were a lot of people who took the chance to move out there and just had to live by their wits. And they did not resort to a life of crime. They did not resort to robbing banks and murdering people to get by. So even that's not really an excuse. I mean, um, you know, they did it because they could. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because obviously... You know, they were, um, to an extent, smart, capable, could have done a lot of things, 
and they chose that and they ended up dying other than Emmett sounds like they all ended up dying very young like in their 20s maybe 30s and you know was it worth it I would have to say no because they the Dalton gang especially they they began their life of crime in like 1890 and by the end of 1892 they were dead so what was it all for I mean so so stupid but that's the family tree. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, I hope this has been fun for you. I, I kind of, I did enjoy this, you know, diving into this and reading more about my distant, very distant, very, very distant relatives. Um, the things people will do just amazes me in like not the good way. Anyway, um, I'm going to try to do more videos. I'm sorry that I ramble so much. It's just, I've, I've said in the past, I'm going to try to do better, but this is just how I talk. So if it bothers you, maybe this isn't the channel for you. Anyway, um, if I've got any of my facts wrong, I'm more than well, more than, you know, more than happy to hear about it. Just be respectful, please, and understand I'm doing the best with the information that I have and while also trying to juggle everything else going on in my life. So um, anyway, have a great day. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Don't shit on yourself or anyone else. And I will see you again next time. Thanks so much for watching. I really, really appreciate you. Bye-bye.